Everybody, thanks for joining us. We're going to be getting started here just in about 90 seconds. 90 seconds, we're going to get the show on the road. Talking about interest rate volatility that I know all of us are uh, feeling the pain right now. I'm excited to have Chris Ledwidge and Nate Morgan from The Lender. We're going to be talking everything interest rates, what we should be doing as investors, and what we should be expecting into the future. We'll get started here in about 60 seconds. Welcome, everybody. If you guys will say hello and let us know what city you're from in the comments, whether you're on YouTube, in one of the Facebook groups, or on the Facebook page, that would be awesome. We're going to get started here in about 30 seconds. 30 seconds, we're going to start the show for you guys. All right, everybody, welcome to Interest Rate Volatility. My name is Bill Faith. I'm the founder of Build Short-Term Rental Wealth. I'm an investor just like you and literally just put another property under contract yesterday because I'm trying to, like everybody tries to slide into DMs. I'm trying to slide in ahead of these interest rates. And I think I got caught uh, just like some of you guys have very recently because they have been skyrocketing very, very quickly. So I'm really excited about the discussion that we're going to have today uh, because interest rates and all of this stuff just should be affecting. It affects our decision making process and when we should be investing, how much we're willing to spend, how it's going to impact our cash flow. But I think if you're in the same boat that I am, I don't know what to expect. I'm not a financial analyst by any means. I'm not a banker. Uh, so what I'm excited to do today is I'm going to learn right here along with you guys is I've got, uh, Nate Norgie and Chris Ledwidge joining me from the lender, and they've got a lot more Intel and insight as to what we can expect. And don't forget the fed is coming in and making an announcement on interest rates in the coming weeks. And they've got their ear to the grindstone. They know what's going on. They're writing loans every day, like hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, a quarter. So let me get them in and let's jump right in and, and get started. Nate, Chris, welcome. How are you guys today? Good. Good to see you again. So I'm going to put you guys right on the spot because I know you guys have probably caught a lot of shit from investors that have got caught kind of in that vortex that we've all been going through for about the last 30, 45 days. Uh, Chris, you and I had a discussion about this a couple of days ago. It was very enlightening. Nate, I really appreciate you. You and I have never met uh, before, so I appreciate you being here. Just kind of lead in and shed some light. What's happened up to this point before we get into the future? Well, thanks. And thanks for having us on. Um, I don't know how I drew the short straw talking about rising interest rates. I'd rather talk about our low fees and low down payments, but here we are. <laughs> right. Um, so basically what's happened is current market conditions. We saw a 1% change in interest rates over a very short period of time from january 1st to about february 7th we had over 100 basis points or one percent change in the short-term interest rates which really drive the non-qm market um, that is uh, highly unusual and very unexpected and so you know what happened why did what happened how did we get there um you guys all remember the word transitory um, inflation, and uh, we figured out that inflation is not transitory. And so the inflation numbers that have been coming back have been higher than expected. And so the market has to gauge how to react to that. And their reaction is going to be uh, pulling the levers that they have in order to try to combat that inflation. 
And one of those levers is obviously interest rates. So the market is always in a position of trying to predict the future. And the only way to predict the future is through um, Fed meetings and what their talking points are. And so if their talking points get a little bit more, you know, we call it hawkish, if they're a little bit more stringent on what they think they're going to do with interest rates, the, the market reacts to that. And when we had an inflation number come out at almost seven and a half percent non-transitory, the market reacted heavily to that. And overnight or over 30 days, a quick turnaround time, rates increased sharply. So Nate, tell me, to, for those of us that don't understand, I know Chris knows, I'm not real smart, right? So what does transitory mean and how is that affecting the rate? So I saw like everybody else, I think publicly, I think it was last week, I saw that inflation's at 7.2%, right? I get that part and that scares the shit out of me because I'm old, just old enough to remember in the early 80s, right before Thriller came out in 80, 84, 1982, Michael Jackson, but Jimmy Carter, you know, leaving us with, you know, 18% mortgage rates, you know, back then. What does transitory mean? And should we be, be should we have fear that we're going to see double digit interest rates in the upcoming months and years? So first transitory, what transitory means is that it's uh, not here for the long term, that it was uh, caused by supply chain issues and things that would clear themselves up in a in a short period of time. Um, so as the market uh, figures out that transitory isn't really the, the word to describe what's going on, inflation is a very difficult thing to predict and understand. And what the market's figuring out is that this inflation is going to be here for a while and they need to, the Federal Reserve from a monetary policy has to do some things to try to combat that inflation. Um, now, should we be worried about double digit interest rates? In my opinion, no. Uh, that would be, um, I think the Federal Reserve is going to, uh, especially not this year. Um, what's going on right now is what can we, what can we uh, you know, look forward to from the next Fed meeting on March 15th? And they've said, hey, listen, we're going to raise interest rates possibly 25 basis points or a quarter percent up to 50 basis points. And we want to look at five interest rate increases this year of uh, equaling a total of 175 basis points or 1.75%. So double digit, you're not going to have to worry about. Gotcha. So Chris, when you and I chatted a couple of days ago, you, you said something to me that kind of calmed the nerves a little bit. And that's that the rates have increased. We're seeing DSCRs between, you know, five to seven and a half percent right now, depending on who these people are going to that are watching today. But you said that's pretty much baked in at this point. You know, as long as we don't get something completely unexpected when the Fed makes our announcement in a couple of weeks, what would cause something in that announcement to either go down or to go up? I mean, what we know they're going to add a quarter a point, a half a point or three quarters or a full point, right? Most likely, I think, isn't the interest rates now based on about the expectation of a quarter point interest? And if that's the case, what, what do you expect if we get a half point? Well, I, I think it's anywhere between a quarter and a half a point is what the is what's expected. And I think what's going on is the lending institutions, the mortgage bankers are anticipating worst case scenario of a half a point announcement. OK, like we're all pretty certain it's going to be no less than a quarter percent, but it could be as much as half a percent. If the Fed comes out on March 15th and they announce a half a percent increase, you shouldn't see a bunch of uh, action on rates as where they are at today. Now, if they come out a little bit south of that uh, half a percent increase, let's say it's 25 basis points, there should be a marginal correction to where the rates are at today. And again, if we come in a little bit north of that half a percent increase, then rates will go up. And that hasn't been baked into the business plans of mortgage bankers in the country right now. So that would make for a bad April, May and June. Now, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I think, you know, through all the experts and everyone that is, you know, building out the model for the, you know, to get through the 15th is expecting no greater than 50%. And there hasn't been an indication 
that this first rate hike is going to be greater than uh, uh, 50 basis points or half a percent. So <clears throat> that's where I would land. And Nate, did you say a second ago you think they're looking to get to maybe 175 basis points like through the course of the year, which would be equivalent to like 1.75% interest rate hike? Yeah, and and remember, it's not like for like. So when I say 100, 175 basis points or 1.75 percent, that doesn't mean that the DSCR rates are going to go up 1.75 percent. That's that's the Fed explaining what they're going to do with the their short-term interest rates to fight inflation. Um, but it will mean in, interest rates increase for sure. Now, what does that mean and how much? It's hard to tell at this point because there's so many other factors that go into that discussion. Um, I think it's something where we're just going to have to, it's, it's going to be a choppy market, just like the equities market is right now. Right. The interest rate market's going to be choppy. And, um, but I do think that based on all the data that's coming in right now that we're going to have we're going to have an environment still with low rates through the end of the year. So I don't think it's something where you sit on the sideline and wait for lower rates. You make deals that make sense based on today's rates. So I'm shopping rates from multiple lenders right now, right? I Chris, you know I put a house under contract yesterday. What about these people and it kind of leads me into Dee, Dee Stump. We'll get to her question here in a second. But what, what should I do as an example? If, I, if I'm under contract, like literally within the last 24 hours, or I'm looking to go under contract in the next week, is there anything that we can do as investors or do we just have to roll with the volatility until we can get locked in? I'll, I'll field that one. I think you know for those that are engaging in purchase contracts or any type of DSCR transaction here or expected to in the next 60 days, I say shop multiple lenders, right? Like obviously, you know, it's odd for me to say that, you know, I'm telling people to not just look at the lender, but go look at other lenders and really compare apples to apples. You know, that's really at my core beliefs. You want to compare apples to apples. Any estimate that we provide you, compare that to another estimate and, and put yourself in a position to have an option, right? I, I think that's really all you can do because we do expect, you know, Again, whatever happens on March 15th is going to bring clarity to what, you know, the rates are going to look like over the next 90 days. But, you know, the best thing you can do is if you're going to engage in that transaction in the next 60 days, shop multiple lenders and don't always pay attention to rate necessarily. Pay attention to your fees, right? Do an ROI or return on investment analysis on what it costs you to get that loan versus, you know, the interest rate you're being given. I need a buzzer button because I want to like confirm what you just said. Can you say that one more time? Because I think as an investor and what I see from my students here, they're only shopping rate. Yeah. But I've talked to people in the last couple of days to where they're getting quoted two and a half points origination, right? Two points origination. Well, if you're, if you're buying a half a million dollar home and you're looking at two and a half points origination, what are we talking there? 15, 20 grand in origination fees? Yeah, easy. I mean, it, it, it just it, it climbs really quick. And so by shopping your lenders where we're at, you know, the lender retail division has historically been equal to or what we call par or an eighth of a percent better as it relates to DSCR loan rates. Because of the compression, I expect this to be on par now. I don't expect that necessarily our rates are going to be an eighth of a percent better consistently, right? I think we're going to be on par. But what you have on the other side over here is your fees, right? That's where we really break away from the crowd. Again, you know, because DSCR loans, 90% of that volume or those loans are originated by brokers. They originate the loan on your behalf in order for them to be compensated. They must charge you fee. And then they send the loan to us for us to fund for them, right? By, by working with us directly, we're able to consistently charge or anywhere from 50 to 60% less in fee, right? So if you can get it, that's why I say confidently go out and shop it, right? And even if you come back to me with an estimate on a DSCR loan, that might be an eighth of a percent better, but I'm charging you 60% less in fee. Maybe, maybe you, I only charge you 30% less in fee and then give you that same interest rate. It's about finding that equilibrium in there and not just focusing, like you said, on the interest rate, but on the fee. Right, because that eighth of percent that you might be shopping for, 
only saves you, let's say, a hundred bucks a month, but I'm saving you 60% on 20,000 in lender fees, that's $12,000. That's a hundred dollars. don't amortize months. this over the course of the loan either, right? Amortize this over how long you're going to hold the freaking property. Exactly. So if, you, if you're, exactly. so like I, and what people don't understand about me is I have half, roughly 40% of my properties have some type of penalty, if you will, associated with it. Cost segregation, so recapture on accelerated depreciation. 1031 to where, you know, I, if I liquidate that cash and don't 1031 again, then I, I have a, a, a tax transaction associated with that. DSCR, prepayment, all of those things versus having what I call, you know, real estate, you know, liquidity to where like the house I'm in now, I've got $1.2 million in liquidity. I will never associate anything with that. So I think we got to make strategic decisions. I love what, what Chris is talking about in regards to that type of structure, because if I look at my MO, I hold a property for an average of three and a half years, right? So I can't amortize an extra $15,000 in fees over a 20 or 30 year AM. I've got to amortize it over that three and a half year period. Um, I think that makes total sense. Let me get to you guys. Mind if I get to a couple of questions here? Sure. Um, Dee Dee Brown Stump has an interesting question. What are interest rates today? Um, if I am buying new construction, how do you suggest a contract is structured to account for the expected rate increases? It could make the property much less profitable. And before they answer, Dee Dee, I'm just going to I'm going to give you just a really quick answer on that first part about interest rates, because I think there's a lot of confusion. I'll let Nate and Chris tackle this in a second, because like in my mastermind group, as an example, we have 48 investors and most of them are very astute investors and people that own two properties, a couple have zero, but you know, to some guys have over a hundred properties. If I'm going in for a loan and Chris is going in for a loan. And as an example, let's just use a DSER product. If Chris is putting 30% down and I want 15%, Chris's rate's going to be lower than mine 99% of the time. Correct, Chris? Mm -hmm. If Chris, so if you look at if I'm buying a million dollar property and he's putting $300,000 down, I'm putting 150 down, the risk mitigation is lower with Chris, right? If we look at, you got appraisal, the 1007, um, you know, a lot of different factors that are going to go into this. So I was talking to one of my mastermind members the other day, they're looking for a 15% down. I'm putting 30% down and they're wondering why I can get a lower rate. So I think those are things that we all have to understand what goes into that qualification. So that's kind of my setup for you guys, Nate and Chris, to answer Dee Dee's first part of her question, what are interest rates now? What are the factors that go in outside of just LTV, credit score? You know, what are the factors that go into where Dee Dee might get a different rate than myself? So factors that might influence the interest rate would be, is the property rural? Is the property a non-warrantable condo? Um, those, those would affect the interest rate on the property. Um, FICO is a big driver of the interest rate. LTV is another big driver of the interest rate. And then the term that you select, are you selecting a seven-year arm, a 10-year arm, a 30-year fix, or a 40-year fix? All those will carry varying uh, rate structures with them. And those are the main components that go into the pricing of your loan. And sorry, just to cut in there, uh, as well as will the property debt service, if yeah. we're using a DSCR loan, we have to have rents that are comparable or as equal to payment. So if, if that's not the case, you have, we can still do the loan. It's a higher interest rate. If you're going to use short-term rental income, to qualify for that DSCR, it's a little bit different terms than using long-term rental income. So there, there is quite a few factors that go into determining rate. So the second part of her question is she's looking at a new construction that won't be completed till December. And a traditional type of funding for that is gonna be go to a commercial lender, you know, get a construction loan, typically interest only, then roll into you know, a, a more traditional package, could be a 30 year interest only, 20 year you know, principal and interest, whatever that would be. And I've seen, at least in my experience, some commercial banks will really have, you have to refi at that transition. I just did one of these three weeks ago and I've been locked in at 4.25% and I've got a great banker and I was actually just no refi cost. My 4.25 has been locked in since March of last year. And I was able to pull $125,000 in cash out 
uh, because of increase in equity and value position. I'm still way below uh, 70% LTV. So I don't think many banks are going to lock in, especially at this point. What would your advice be to Didi that's looking at getting into starting new construction now, whether it is with DSCR or commercial, or does she have any options to lock that long of a term? Yeah, so <clears throat> this is assuming she's working with a builder, This, you know, like a, a KB Homes, a Lennar Homes, a Meritage Homes, a builder that's building the property, you put in an earnest money deposit, you secure that property, they build it, and when that property is ready for delivery, you bring in your loan and close on your loan. Okay, so if, if that's in fact what we're dealing with here, I'll give a few pieces of advice. Number one, you're going to want to look at the uh, builder's approval contingency period. They probably have some type of boilerplate stamp that they put in there between 16 and 21 calendar days from the time you go into contract that you must get a loan approval, right? But that's going to be difficult with a DSCR loan, primarily because, again, the main qualifying factor in a DSCR loan is the rent potential on the subject property. We can't even perform an appraisal and a rental survey on that subject property until it's built. So we won't really have that definitive number till near the end of the transaction. So your loan approval is very, it's, it's purely conditional. And I think this is, this also goes for a lot of other, you know, builder type loans is that once you get loan approval and you release your loan approval contingency, you're forfeiting your right to recapture your EMD if that loan falls through. Understand that you're going to get a conditional loan approval first. And until we get that rent survey and appraisal in, the true loan approval doesn't exist. It's just conditional. So <clears throat> in this market, you're going to have a hard time negotiating a, a, an extended loan approval contingency date or a loan approval contingency date that meets your circumstances for a DSCR loan because it's a seller's market. But I would be very, I would, I'd pay attention to that and truly understand the verbiage in that loan approval contingency and also understand that you're only going to receive a conditional approval until the appraisal and the rent survey are received. Okay, that's first and foremost. Now, as far as locking in of the interest rate, that cannot be done again until the appraisal on a DSCR loan cannot be done until the appraisal and the rent surveys are verified. So that's near the end of the transaction. And the last piece I'll put on there is whatever that interest rate that you get quoted here today, you're not closing till the end of the year, ask your originator loan officer, whomever you're working with, what's my max qualifying interest rate? Yes, today I'm doing 20% down, I'm at a 5.5% interest rate. We expect X amount of rental revenue on the property. And right now today, that's one-to-one. -one. We can DSCR at one-to-one. -one. But what if that interest rate goes up to six and a half percent? Am I still going to be able to make, you know, cover the payment with the rent potential? So again, ask for a qual rate, understand your loan approval contingency verbiage, and be very clear about not having uh, what a conditional loan approval is versus a true loan approval. And then I would just add to that, Bill, if, if it's possible to buy the home with a traditional loan product, let's say a second home loan product, the in-house lender for the builder may have access to a long-term lock on a traditional loan where they can lock in the loan longer than, you know, from six to 12 months. That's a question that I would, that's something I would explore if I was in that situation. That's an interesting point. I just literally had that discussion with a friend and an investor of mine last night who's starting a project uh, today. So hopefully that helps you, uh, Didi, um, you know, kind of in your in your decision process. Uh, this question comes from Angela Ray. January, uh, it was 3% for a second home loan. Today, it's 4.75%. With the Fed's raising April uh, 1, well, April 15th, and another rate hike uh, that will be announced on in March, does that mean 1.75%? So I think she might have some numbers, but does she? I think she's she's asking, should I expect another 1.75% increase in March? Yes, let me clarify what's going on there. You're talking about um, with the second home mortgage, that wasn't a rate hike. What we experienced and what will um, in fact be in play as of April 1st was a loan level pricing adjustment. It wasn't a rate hike. And what happened there was Fannie Mae came in and said, we need to really not lend as much money on second homes as we are. We'll still do it, but we got to make the cost on that higher. 
Right. And the reason for that is uh, it really has to do with primary residence. It's the affordability for someone that doesn't own a home. They, I mean, they're renters and they want to get into a home. They, they just, this is the toughest market it's ever been to buy a home, period. And so Fannie Mae's like, look, we got we to gotta give people that don't own an opportunity to buy before we're giving people opportunity to buy their second, third, and fourth vacation homes. So this was, a, this was just a Fannie Mae policy. That's a loan level pricing adjustment, increasing the cost on that loan, which did increase the interest rate. And <clears throat> coupled with the Fed increase, yes, that's where you're going to see the Fannie Mae second home mortgages at 3% early January and post April 1st, you're looking at 4.75. Probably if, if you have a sub 680 FICO and you're trying to do that, you're easily going to be in the 5% on that second home mortgage after April 1st, probably somewhere around June, July. Yeah. So to, just for to go back, her question, it, the interest rate's going to rise based on what interest rates do. You're not going to see 1.75. So if it goes up, a quarter, you're going to see, you know, a relative rate increase based on that quarter, not another 1.75. Awesome. Uh, with interest rates going up, is there a potential for banks to increase rates on existing mortgage loans? And that's from Stephen Claremont on Facebook. No, I mean, if you have a, if you have an existing loan and a, you closed on that loan, you have a term, those terms are what they are. They're, the bank can't come back and increase the rate on, let's say you have a 30 year fixed at 4%. I think that's the question. If that's the case, they can't come back and raise that interest rate. And what if they have an interest only on an arm? Uh, yes. Yeah, so there's terms on your interest only arm that are going to raise based on whatever those caps are, right? So they can go up by, in some situations, up by 2% every two years, depending on what interest rates are doing, or we have a seven, six arm. So, you know, it, it uh, is going to reset every six months based on what the interest rates are doing. And there's the caps that you have to look at and each loan's a little bit different. Gotcha. Um, I don't know who this is, but somebody said, Chris and Nick, let's talk about a cash out refi on my Big Bear property after this. I want to do a remodel and add 462 square feet to my home. How is this affecting refining? I assume the exact same way that it's affecting, you know, just traditional new acquisition rates, right? Yeah. And you know what? I mean, I think that's a good segue just to talk about what's what's what is really still really great. We're talking about interest rates going up, but there's not any credit events going on. So our loan to values, our FICO scores, the qualification for loans is still very, very attractive. Um, so, you know, purchases were doing up to 85 percent in cash out refinances on his, on the Big Bear property. We'd be all the way up to what is it, 75 now, 75% mm -hmm. on the cash out on from an LTV perspective. Gotcha. And you don't see that changing as the rate increase? There's, there, there's nothing to say that that would, that would change. No credit events going on. Everybody's, uh, you know, making their payments on time, you know, cross our fingers, knock on wood. Right. Um, so, no. So if you do a cash out refi on a DSCR, do you have to go through the appraisal process and re-qualify on a, te a 1007? Uh, we do have to go through an appraisal process because we have to verify that the collateral is qualified, um, but we do not go through a 1007 process. We look at the historical rents. We do a 12 month look back on the subject property and average the rents to determine the DSCR. What about the timing of the appreciation? I mean, a lot of us, Chris, you own a property in Big Bear. I'm sure that's appreciated by a couple of hundred grand over the last year. Um, I know I've had properties in my portfolio. What if I bought a property, let's say early 2021, 500,000 bucks. It's worth 800, 850 today. If it's appreciated that fast and it appraises at 850, can I do a cash out refi up to 75%, 80% with you guys at that point? Yes, you can. So when you're talking about rapid appreciation in that context, as long as you're outside the six months from when you acquired the property, we can refinance it at whatever the newly appraised value is. It's only when you're trying to do a cash out refinance transaction within the six months period of acquiring the property 
that we must use the acquired sales price. So if you're outside six months, we'll use the newly appraised value. So I think that's really important for all of you out there to understand um, because I've had a couple of people that have come to me that have had that scenario recently and they've wanted to cash out refi. They've gone to more traditional commercial lenders and because the rapid appreciation has happened so quickly, they haven't wanted to you know, do a cash out refi to a 75 or 80 percent LTV. Uh, so you can get that done through a DSCR product. Um, if I cash out refi, do it still traditional like five year prepayment penalties? Um, Correct. Cash out refi? Correct. Gotcha. Um, let's see. Any thoughts on how these rate increases could impact home prices and supply or demand? Yeah. So right now in this country, we have a 5.5 million home deficit, right? There's not enough homes for people out there to own or occupy and live in. And there is no plan in place. Home, new homes being built cannot go at such a rate that's going to make a dent in that 5.5 million deficit. And people are only multiplying. There, this is going to be an issue that we're going to be watching for the next couple decades. Until some organized effort comes in to solve the housing crisis, in the sense that there's a lack of supply, you're not going to see housing prices crumble. Unless we have a credit event, the housing prices will remain in short supply. Now, yes, interest rates are going to go up. Buyers are going to drop out of the marketplace. Less people are going to be motivated to sell and upgrade their living situation because they might be in a 2.75% in a house that they're happy enough with but they don't want to now sell and upgrade to that next level home and take an interest rate of high fours, even 5%. So less inventory will make it to the market, less buyers will be in the market, but it will not be enough to impact the deficit of 5.5 million. Will we see the rapid appreciation that we've seen? No, I, I think that we're going to see at best a plateau or at worst a plateau. And then, you know, there, until there's a, global organized solution to make a dent in that housing deficit, it's going to be a long time before we see any major depreciation in the housing market. We would all just have to stop multiplying, but who wants to do that, right? Yeah. No. Um, Jay Sneed asks, can you define a credit event? Uh, it's just a credit event would be so, something that people stop making payments for some reason in a large, uh, from a large scale would then would take the investors and the mortgage companies would then have to adjust what they are doing from a FICO LTV, uh, you know, a qualification standpoint on our loan. So a credit event would be somebody is, is something is causing people not to make their payments that would be a credit event causing us to have to change loan program guidelines. <clears throat> awesome. Uh, Brandon Sullivan, uh, is there any concern for lack of demand from non-QM note buyers on Wall Street and a volatile interest rate market? You know, so the what's happened from our perspective and, you know, from me having my ear to the ground and talking to some of the biggest guys out there from, you know, Credit Suisse to, PIMCO is they they want to buy what they want to know is what the Fed policy is going to be. So they're making good purchases and they remember they don't buy just non QM uh, notes. They buy use They buy car notes. They buy all kinds of uh, financial instruments out there. And so if they're getting a better yield somewhere else, then there's going to be less demand in the non QM market. So to answer the question, I don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, I do think that they're looking for clarity in the market. And, and I'll, I'll say th there's kind of the other side of the coin there in the sense it's not so much that they don't want to buy the non-QM product, but the volume of the non-QM non product over the last, uh, really since we came out of COVID it, from a non-QM standpoint, early 21. So we're about 14 months back in the game on non-QM being bought on the secondary market. The volume of non-QM for sale from lenders has gone up, right? So the so now the buyers are like, well, we'll buy the same amount, but we're only going to buy at, say, this interest rate now. 
And that's going to be a driving factor on, on that. It's not a matter of do they not want to buy. There's just so much of it. They can be more discretionary with what they are purchasing as it relates to wanting higher yield. Uh, Philip Munoz, for an investor that has never done a DSCR loan, what is the difference in the process of applying for getting a DSCR loan versus a conventional or traditional Fannie and Freddie? The, the main difference is, you know, Fannie Freddie, we're really looking at you as the, as the individual and your ability to repay the loan. With a DSCR, we are not looking at your personal ability to pay the loan. We're not looking at your income statements, tax returns, pay stubs, none of that. We are looking at the subject property's uh, ability to debt service the principal interest taxes and insurance, right? We're looking at the rent potential on the subject property as the ability to repay the loan versus your ability. Yeah, much, much closer to a, what you would find in a commercial loan and but more geared toward the individual for investment property. So Philip is a gentleman that's done two DSCRs. What Chris, I've done two with you in the last 90 days, essentially, I think. Uh, credit score and cash are the two big things, right? So you have to prove that you have the cash. So like the first time that I did my first loan with the lender, you know, they, I, and I have mine dispersed across multiple accounts. It's not like I keep $300,000 in one account. So I literally had to give them, I think 90 days we went back and I gave them like four or five or six different bank accounts so they could see the funds that were already there. Well, now I keep all the lenders funds in one account uh, to be able to show it to them. But the other component, Philip, and I don't know where you are on your journey. So like, I won't have any cash out of pocket on this transaction and I didn't on the last transaction. So I know they're going to, so I talked to them yesterday. Uh, I went under contract last night. I know Deb Stark or whoever is going to be managing my loan. The first thing she's going to ask for is proof of funds. So I will put her in contact with my, uh, they worked with her before, Lori, who's my 1031 intermediary. And I'm going to put 30% down on a $1.6 million transaction. Lori will have to give her proof of funds to show that I have, I don't even know the exact dollar, $527,000. And that's really kind of the first credit check or first checkpoint, right, Chris? Mm -hmm. Because yeah. they're not gonna ask for my tax returns. He's not gonna ask for, you know, audited p and for my other businesses that I haven't filed a return for 2021 yet, which a commercial bank will ask you. You know, Fannie and Freddie's gonna wanna see all that. They don't give a shit what my, D, my personal DTI is, even though it's virtually nothing. You know, but a commercial bank, even though they say many times they're going to want it, you have to make sure that on a commercial and a, a conventional that you can pay back that loan. So if you're somebody that has cash and like I look at all my friends in the hospitality industry, if you owned restaurants, if you were in the, the ground transportation space, you know, whatever it was in hospitality, you got crushed in 2020. Even if you had a great year in 2021, that's going to be challenging for you to get a conventional loan. Right. Mm -hmm. So they're going to look at that run rate with your tax returns and then probably an audited PL, you know, for 2021 until you file. So depending on what your income streams are, Philip, and how much cash you have, it makes it a lot easier. So the other part of this is strategical, as I talked about at the very beginning. So I have half of mine, what I call taxable event properties with um, that are really, I can't, I, if I liquidated, I would take some type of hit from cost egg, 1031. DSCR prepayment penalty. The other parts of my portfolio and my personal residence are the what I call the real estate liquidity that nothing's associated with. I have nothing, no cost eggs, no prepayment penalties on DSCRs, nothing. I can liquidate that asset. So I think you need to think about how you're going to build your portfolio. And I think, and I love Chris, I love the lender, I love DSCRs, but I, I don't, don't think it's the perfect fit for everybody at and don't do your entire portfolio as well, you know, because the prepayment, prepayment, the prepayment penalties are no joke. I've got a great relationship with these guys, but if they've sold my loan, which is, you know, what happens, that new company I don't have the relationship with. But I say, hey, I'm having a little struggle right now. Can you give me some help on that prepayment penalty? They're probably going to say, hell no. You sign the contract, right? You're going to have to pay the the 1% for one year, two years, three years, whatever that is. So I think you just really need to be strategic in how you're putting 
your portfolio together, but also understand what you can or cannot qualify for. And you need to have these discussions early. You know, I don't care if you're using your local commercial bank, the lender, 10% down with Jeff Chisholm, you know, going to, you know, traditional commercial local banks or Chase, you need to have those discussions early so you know where you're at and know what your options are ahead of time. And that's one of the things that kind of why I migrated towards the lender, specifically in the DSR, DSCR space. There's a lot of bullshit that goes on in that space of funding, and there's a tremendous amount of bait and switch. You can go to, is it, I don't even know, the, is it thelender.com, Chris? DSCR.thelender.com. Oh, I'm sorry. DSCR.thelender.com. And you will literally see their programs and what the qualifications are there. And that's what I love when Chris came, or I shouldn't say came, but virtually, you know, went through at our last boot camp and did some cost comparisons, but they're 100% transparent. And if you guys know me, I'm transparent. I give you guys the good, the bad, and the ugly. When I F up and I had a bad deal, I'm going to show you and walk you through it so you don't make that mistake. So that transparency is something that is really important to me. And that's why I have them here because there's others specifically in this space that are not transparent. DSCRthelender.com? I'm going to post it in the comments here for everyone. <clears throat> Cool. And if anybody has any uh, any last minute questions, we've got just a couple of minutes and then uh, we're going to wrap up. Nate, Chris, do you guys have anything that you want to wrap up with? No, I mean, I think that's that's all good information right there. Is there anything you wanted to? No, I mean, I think that, you know, with these rising interest rates, it can seem scary. I just still think it's one of the best times in history to obtain DSCR loan financing. I'll tell you that this, you know, the the terms have just never been better. We were we were spoiled this last year with awesome interest rates, but these interest rates are still great. So I wouldn't sit on the sideline because of interest rates. So I'm 48 years old. I'm going to tell my grandchildren one day, Hey, you know, Johnny, you remember what? Back in 2021, I had a 3.75 interest rate. And he's going to say, you're so full of shit, grandpa. Interest rates are 10%. We've never, we're never going to see interest rates like what we saw over the last couple of years ever again. No. And if you have to pay 5% or 6%, ask your parents. They were happy to pay 9 and 10% from 1980 to 1986. It's going to happen again at some point, and we could be on the early cusp of getting there. So yeah. the reason that I bought, have a property under contract, two other properties, if I close them 45 days, I'll be in four months, three new properties, right? Because I want to get in because I'm a believer that six, seven, eight at some point is going to be our new normal like it was. Everything comes around in our economies. And we're 12, 13 years removed from the last one, which means we're overdue by like about three to four years, right? So yeah. there could be some event. And this could be could be the precipice of that. That's why I think we should get in now. Somebody else, and I've got to go in about 90 seconds to get ready for another um, event. But I want to leave with this. Number one, the lender, they're my DSCRs of choice because they're transparent and they're easy to work with. Two, um, I think you need to understand that just as Chris and Nate stated, and Chris said it very eloquently about what our new home inventory is right now and how, how many homes we would, we'd have to build seven and a half million homes a year for about 15 years to get us back to like pre-COVID levels. That's not going to happen. Supply chain, labor issues, all that type of stuff, it's impossible. The same thing's gonna happen with rent. Somebody asked, how is this interest rate gonna affect our rental incomes? You should not be planning on 2023, 24, 25, being the same as what happened in 2021. There's no question there's gonna be a leveling off and the demand will diminish slightly. But I do not see the great recession crash that we saw in the real estate industry happening in the short-term rental space. And if it does, it's going to have a, a similar effect of what happened in similar markets, in my opinion, in 2009 and 10 and 11, as we saw in COVID. The urban areas, the fly-in markets are the ones that will be affected much more than the traditional drive-in vacation rental markets. So it's a reason Chris is nodding his head. He's invested in the Big Bear. Think about if you Big Bear's outside of Los Angeles, it's like an hour no traffic from LA, right? Yeah. But he's drawing off of Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, 
Temecula, Palm Springs, Bakersfield, Ventura. He has this huge DMA to go to Big Bear. Why do you guys think Gatlinburg and the Smokies does so well? And I'll tell you, why do you think I just invested into North Carolina? Because it's another driving market. It's why I've got $5 million deployed in Gulf Shores, Alabama. So pick your markets wisely and find the places like Cape Sandblast that I said on the, I didn't say it on the broadcast the other day. I posted in there. That's where I got this sub $700,000 uh, beachfront property for a client of mine. That's why I'm investing in North Carolina in a second tier market as opposed to going into the Smokies or Blue Ridge where all these real estate agents and the demand have just driven up the pricing, right? So invest wisely, make sure that you're financing wisely as well. And let's give Chris and Nate a big round of applause. Give them a like button. I really appreciate you guys jumping on with me to uh, share your insights from the inside uh, with all of our investors as to what's happening. Uh, thank you to the lender and Chris and Nate. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. All right, everybody. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you guys soon.